Hey there, entrepreneurs. My name is Sushant and welcome to Trep Talks. This is the show where I interview successful e-commerce entrepreneurs, business executives, and thought leaders, and ask them questions about their business story and also dive deep into some of the strategies and tactics that they have used to start and grow their businesses. And today, I'm really excited to welcome Dinesh Tadepalli to the show. Dinesh is the co-founder of Incredible Eats. Incredible Eats creates edible cut cutlery to reduce single-use plastics in an effort to help preserve our oceans. Incredible Eats is on a mission to replace all plastic utensils with edible options. And today I'm going to ask Dinesh a few questions about his entrepreneurial journey and some of the strategies and tactics that he has used to start and grow his business. So thank you so much for joining me today at Trip Talks, Dinesh. Hey, um, thanks for inviting me, Sushant. It's really nice talking to you and uh, looking forward to a good podcast. Yeah, so it's interesting. I mean, your business is very mission driven. So can you share a little bit about, you know, what, yeah, maybe you can share a little bit about what your product is and okay. how are you trying to help the environment? Yeah, sure. So um, as you already hinted that we are the manufacturers and distributors of edible cutlery. So you can eat your spoon. So it's not something out of the blue. It is out of the blue. But yeah, you can literally eat your spoon after eating with it. So this concept arised uh, when I was at an ice cream shop with my kids. And when I, was, I just had an ice cream for like 10 minutes, like everyone else. And then threw the through the cup and the spoons and uh, like by by chance i looked into the bin and i saw like thousands of plastic spoons there so they were like separated in the sense the cups were in a separate bin and the spoons were in a separate bin so i i looked at the huge volume of that it was a pretty famous ice cream shop and one question suddenly hit me i am an educated person i am aware of plastic pollution but why didn't i think twice before using a plastic spoon so that was the question that started this journey of mine um, I have been an engineer by background for like almost 12, 12 years. I still work as an engineer and that became my passion, so much of my passion that I sold my home to build a facility, to help oh, us wow. to help with the facility. So, and I, because there are a lot of things that we're like aware of, but I'm, I was very, it, it, I would say I fell, I fell into that guilt consciousness, basically thinking that, okay, for the past 10 years or even since I was born, how much plastic have I used? How much, I, how much have I contributed to the planet? How do I get rid of that? So that was the like that, that guilt that later turned into this huge passion that I need to do something about it. I don't want to start another star, software company or a hard, like any other company to make just money, but to make mm. an impact as well. So that has been my goal since the beginning. And uh, that's how we started this. And thankfully, things are going pretty well and i we have already they, recently we just like completed our three million plastic re reduced goal so so i'm happy with the decisions i've made i'm happy with the time and the money that i put in so far and happy that i met the right people to make this possible so in terms of the product it's really just the edible spoon or are you also creating other um, edible cutlery also in the yeah just to give you know, like a, just a little more overview of the product, the spoons are currently made with grains, whole grains, they're non-GM, wheat, oat, chickpea, brown rice, and corn. And obviously we have multiple flavors, like both in savory and sweet. And each spoon can stay firm for up to 20 to 30 minutes in hot soups, like hot products. So they're pretty firm and crunchy and you can eat it right after. And even if you don't have the appetite to eat it, you can just Put them away and they will decompose like food um coming back to the other shapes so we started with the spoons because it was the easiest shape to make um we just recently launched our sporks which is like a substitution of forks because forks will be too fragile to make into an edible fork so we convert it into a spork so it can be used both as a fork and a spoon and um like straws we just started talking with some manufacturers and we are getting some initial versions of edible straws and we're also in ground and at home and at, at home and in our company in india we're also working on the straws but it's i i expect them to be there in the market by march of this year march april of this year and beyond that is chopsticks so we already have the design sealed and confirmed and we will be enabling the chopsticks like June, July. And again, it's scaling slowly because it's mostly bootstrap business. We're not like heavily invested or anything. So these are the four shapes that we're looking for. And why I stuck with I and mean, why I kind of like kept only with the cutlery part is my research showed that um, the cutlery is the worst culprit, especially with respect to the plastic pollution. The reason is the compostable or the biodegradable cutlery that they claim 
is not actually truly biodegradable unless you send it to the right composting facilities. So I spoke with some composting facilities. They they hate cutlery because there's so much of um, what do you call it? other plastic sources that get involved and pollute it. So that's why they hate it and they directly divert to the landfills where they don't compost properly. But if you look at the takeout box, like a cup, a, like a cup or a like even a clamshell takeout box or even a plate, it's easy for them to compost if they are compostable, by the way. I want to be cautioned there, not a plastic one. If they are compostable, then it's relatively easier for them to accept it. So it's lesser of the evils, but um, that's why I thought we'll start with the cutlery, aim with it. As we grow, then we'll introduce other shapes as needed. So the interesting thing is you, you said um, that you are an engineer and you mm -hmm. still have your full-time job, you're mm -hmm. still working. Mm -hmm. um, can you share, is this, uh, is it because you love engineering and you want to continue it or is it more of a uh, risk, risk management it, thing where, you know, it, you want to make sure that your business is generating enough income for you to be able to replace your, you know, daytime uh, job before you can go 100% in entrepreneurship? It's a mix of all the reasons that you claim. So one is uh, actually the biggest reason is immigration, <laughs> not even be in my control. So I, I still am on a visa. I'm okay. clo inching closer towards my green card. So I can't really quit my job if I have to stay here. So that's one reason, one of the biggest reasons. The second reason is um, I am not doing this startup of mine just to pay myself or, you know, just to get more, become rich. I want to make an impact first. So I put a goal to myself till I reduce 100 million single use plastics from the planet, I will not take a penny from my business. Okay. I, and even, even as a salary, I won't take it. So then I have to sustain my family. How do I do that? I have two young kids. So that's the reason why my job is helping me with that. Uh, yeah, the side, the side effect is I have to stay long, stay awake for a long time and work twice as hard as I should. So, so that's, a, but that's the ch challenge that I took myself to, you know, make that impact. And even beyond that, I'm a very content person. So my, as I mentioned, I, my goal is not to be a millionaire or make a million dollar company or a billion dollar company. As long as we make that much impact is what I'm more into. Like literally, if I don't mind giving, not having any profits, if I can actually, have an order of like 10 million plastic, like edible spoons from a company. That's fine because I, I'm looking at that impact because I, there's, not, there's no life which is dependent on it as of now. Because both me and Jack, Jack is my other partner who's in, in the US who works with us. And, uh, and back in India, Cruel is the main partner for with us. He's also a partner of Incredible Eats and he owns the manufacturing facility in India under Trishula. So uh, Cruel is, uh, is so even he didn't, doesn't expect anything from the US company. So he's just trying to deal with them and scaling up in the Indian facility as well. So most of us, all of us are aligned with respect to the impact goal first. So make sure that it, it, it helps the planet before even we think about making money. So it seems like you definitely have two other partners. Um, mm -hmm. So you had that moment, that aha moment when, you know, mm -hmm. you saw all that plastic. Mm -hmm. What was the next step? Like, did you, I'm, I'm assuming you, you did not automatically think, hey, mm -hmm. can, we, can we make an edible spoon? Like, how did you go from that um, moment to actually creating this? Like, yeah, sure, sure. So once that moment has happened, that lightning moment or that guilt moment of us using so much plastic and why people are not thinking about it. See, my biggest question was, why aren't we thinking about it in our actions? We, we hear about these things, but we, we just feel sad and we forget it. So my biggest concern was why as a regular people, like, yeah, I understand if you're like, if you don't have any money, you have to resort on something like that, then it's fine. But if, we, if you are well-fed, we are well-educated and all that stuff. So why aren't we thinking these such small things that are going to help uh, hurt us later on, uh, our, our kids that, rather. So I did some market research for close to like four or five months. Um, and I understood what are the alternatives that exist in the market for plastic. I, that's where I came across the compostable and biodegradable. I did come across them before, but I really, I know they're made from corn and spagasi sugar cane and all that stuff, but they still go through a huge of huge chemical process. And most of the products have a asterisk on the top saying that it's only compostable in composting facilities. So I realized that it's just greenwashing because cities don't like literally, I'm telling you that I think there are just about eight to 10 major cities in the US which have composting facilities available. The rest of them don't have. So what's the point? Like if, if it goes to the landfill, it'll stay in the environment for like 500 years. Hmm. So then it's, it's just a false marketing that I noticed. 
So then I came across edible cutlery, actually. It was, the edible cutlery existed even before. A lot of people ask me, there's this company in India called Bakey's. They had this, they brought this, they became super famous and you just copied of, copied it from them and all that stuff. Yeah, I, I understand what, where they're getting at because people don't know what's ha- what has happened. And hopefully all these uh, talks that, we, or, that I have will explain them better. So I came across that. I tried to approach them saying, hey, yeah, why aren't we making that edible cutlery at scale and making it better? But they haven't responded. So I thought, okay, fine, let be. Like I was trying to find other alternative solutions. Like I, I was I was going through, I went to India for using my paternity leave and I like went, met a lot of manufacturers. I even went to Andaman Nicobar. I went to Malaysia, Singapore. There are like a lot of places that I went to find the right alternatives to plastic. And what are, not just for a cutlery, right? Even for, for bags, plastic bags, even for uh, water bottles, plastic bottles, like water bottles. So uh, not just about cutlery. I went and explored into other products. That's why you'll see a like a grocery bag on my website too right now. So um then what happened, uh, I met another part, my, my current partner, Cruel. He was also trying to make an edible cutlery, but I noticed what's the difference between him and uh, Bakey's. So by the time I went and met Cruel, Bakey's has already kind of closed the shop. And we, I, I actually had some contacts there to ask them why, what happened to you guys? You, were, you became super famous. Millions of people came to know about you. Why, why didn't you succeed? That's when we came to know that they, didn't, they lacked the engineering aspect of it. They in they found the product, they're able to do it manually, but they couldn't do it scalable. Like they couldn't make it scalable. So um, so they could only make hundreds of spoons, not thousands of spoons per day. And that's where my engineering degree came into use. Hmm. Uh, till then, it was only like passion, finding the right alternative, right manufacturer. And thankfully, Kruvel is a mechanical engineer too. Hmm. He, he used to fix uh, bikes and uh, cars, like hmm. literally, like the machines, he used to take machines and build them by hand. Hmm. So, and I'm an electrical engineer by background and, and, and also had this huge passion and like some money that I had to invest from my all my savings. So then Kruvel and me came up together. We spent a lot of time to make the machine first. Till then, Till we made the machine, it took us about one year. It didn't happen overnight uh, and many trials. And the biggest challenge was the thickness or the hardness of the spoon or the spoon, like, or, or the spork, right? It has to be hard enough for you to use it and then easy enough to bite it after. Hmm. It has to have that balance. That was the hardest part because making something by in an oven is not that hard, but making sure that that, that compression of the flour and the pressure and the tensile strength exists so that's what was the longest time taking aspect that in our in our in our journey and around 2019 of february that's when the first machine that we in, invested in made about 100 spoons per day just 100 spoons per day it's a small one mm-hmm. and then i came to the us and uh, i came back to the us at the time and then i decided i went to a show oh by the way I, when i came back i had a big question i'm not from the food industry i have zero experience in the food industry Hmm. I only bought and ate food, never sold food to anyone before. Hmm. So how do I learn it? So that's when I know that their trade shows exist. And I Hmm. Googled all the list of trade shows that I need to go to. I separated down by cost because I didn't have that much money because most of the money I had or I saved, I invested in the facility. So I chose the ones which are very, very local and regional, not like like not like Expo West and Fancy Food Show and all the big guys. So very small ones, which are reasonably priced. And I actually asked them, hey, can you please give me a free booth or at least share me a booth with someone else hmm. because this is going to save the planet. I did some like wacky or very different approach of contacting people and just asking them my heart out saying, showing my passion and asking them, hey, do something good and help me out here. Few people, actually, there are a couple of trade shows which gave me free booth also. They're very mm. small regional ones, but but they understood the need of this. And uh, the first trade show I went was in February, right after, like two weeks after I came back here, after the machine, we figured out, that, okay, it was able to make the product. I got like about like 20 or 30 spoons in my hand. That was a cater show in New Orleans. It's a, it's a show where all, like, all the caterers meet across the America. And I went there, I got a small booth and I didn't have any banners or any decoration or any Hmm. nothing. I just went there with a suitcase, Hmm. just a few printouts, like a paper printouts of what product is and what the cost is and just a few spoons in my hand. That's it. But I had a booth, like it's a small five by 10 booth. And I literally had to go to Walmart, get a table and a chair. I didn't, because I I didn't, I was not prepared. This was the first time going to a trade show. I had zero clue what needs to be done there. Um, I looked at all these fancy booths like, oh my God, I was like, overwhelmed. what is going to happen to me? Like, but it doesn't matter. I went there to learn rather than to sell. 
because I wanted to understand how the food industry works. How do they sell? What are the different terms? What are the different conditions? What are the different cost pricing? What, what are the margin that we need to include? I need to understand that, right? My whole point to go to that show is to meet people, talk to them and understand. You can't learn that in a Google or in an MBA. People yeah. will you'll get through that through experience in this thing. So once I went there, the last day of the show, a caterer from Canada came in and he asked me one question. I'll order 150,000 spoons right now. Right now, can you give me the best cost? Hmm. I slashed all my margins, what I thought it should have. Hmm. <laughs> and I told him, okay, this is the cost. He said, yes, please take the order. I need 150,000 spoons. Hmm. So that's me. That's my first order, 150K. I, my, my factory was not even ready for that. Okay. So, hmm. so that's when I came back home. I told him I'll do it. Give me like four months and I'll do it. I told him, I openly told him like, yeah, my facility doesn't have that capacity right now, but I can increase it, make it better, but give me like four months time and I'll fulfill the, fulfill it for you. Did he prepay or did, did no, he? No, he, 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 most of the okay. people, most of the people in food, food industry pay like net 30, net 45, forget okay. about prepayments. <laughs> so, so uh, I went, came back home. I, I talked, talked to my wife. I told her we have to sell this home. I had a home in California at the time. I bought okay. it like in the, in the right time. So. I told, I told her the only way I can fulfill this order is by selling the home and we should do it. And thankfully, my wife, who is also the partner in the company right now, she agreed to it and uh, we sold the home. We invested that money in the facility. We scaled it up and within four to five months, we fulfilled that order to Canada. Right. So what so, kind of... Okay. Yeah, so that that's how it started and I never stopped going to the trade shows. In 2019 alone, I went to nine trade shows, spoke to close to 3000 people to understand how the food industry works and meanwhile sold close to a million spoons so are you selling mostly to like businesses who are doing something else with these spoons or or is it mostly like a consumer item uh, in, in, initially my approach was b2b the businesses the reason is that's where majority of the plastic consumption is like if you go to ice cream chain like a chain of ice cream shops or like caterers or even even like Mac mcdonald's wendy's and all these big chains all these food service chains even takeouts and restaurants so i wanted to approach the problem there rather than uh, going directly to the people and asking them to use us because mm. see at that point my my thought process was if if i don't want to sell it to a directive consumer because a consumer has an option to take his reusable spoon or fork from his home to somewhere he's going outside Hmm. He, I, he should not be using my, my product just for the fun of it, but I want him to be truly sustainable because no matter what, I, I'm going to be honest saying that a, reuse, a stainless steel reusable spoon or a spork is the best option, not edible spoons. Yeah. But yes, if you have a single use need, like for example, if you're going on a hike or if you, if you have a huge birthday party at your home and you, you don't want to wash all the utensils, yes, for those exceptional cases where single use is kind of a must, yeah, please do that. Please use edible spoons or edible sporks. Hmm. But beyond that, as much as, you, as any person listening to this, I want them to use reusables because that's, one, that's gonna help the planet no matter hmm. what. Hmm. So, but COVID changed my thought process because COVID is when yeah, all the B2B got shut down. Mm. It was very hard for them. I couldn't sell more to them. Mm. But people have started approaching me and saying, hey, that they changed my thought process. Like I know a few people who came back and said, hey, I'm taking these spoons in my in my wallet to the to the store. Like in my it's always in my purse. I have like few few spoons in the car, few spoons in my wallet. So when I go to my next takeout or ice cream, I don't want I'll I am happily saying no to the plastic spoon that's offered. And I'm taking the spoon from my from my wallet and eating and from my purse and eating eating with that. So that's when I and I had time also by the time to convert to B2C and direct to consumer. So that's when we switched over. And we, so, we do we still do both. We still do both. My 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 focus 70% is B2B, 30% okay. is B2C. And your business has been growing since uh, year over year as, uh, so far? Uh, yeah, a yeah, first year was very good. But then 2020, because of COVID, everything kind of went on a screeching halt. And 2020, August is when we started enabling the product on Amazon and Shopify. Mm -hmm. Till before that, we didn't sell anything. So literally first half, first half of 2020, it was almost nil because all my ice cream chains stopped because mm -hmm. they couldn't help it. Yeah. They themselves were trying to hard to stay, stay afloat. Uh, one thing we noticed was this product has a very good word of mouth or marketing aura to it. Hmm. So one one very in, uh, interesting fact that we came out was we spent only like close to $2,000 in ads and marketing. Hmm. 
we made a close to 80000 in revenue direct to consumers okay that was very surprising because i didn't have to spend a lot of cpg companies spend a lot of money on ads mm. Mm. but the i uh, thankfully i had a lot of organic outreach but again mm. it was not all uh, super successful i would say because we went very slow i didn't i didn't rush the reason i didn't rush was one thing i understood attending all the shows and meeting so many people people skip that critique phase like mm. if i'm bringing a product to the market when you are like when we make it it's our baby so we love it we think it's the best in the world mm. but that might not be the reality people might not conceive it or perceive it in the same way like we do because they didn't make it they didn't go through this entire effort of making that mm. they just buying it and using it so they might not go understand the pain behind it mm. so we i wanted to understand how this fits in the market or how mm. people are liking it and mm. and there's no comparison right like for example if i make a new type of cupcake people knows people know what a cupcake is and how it should taste mm. so they can expect something or they don't expect something but when i'm bringing something to the market which people never tried which never mm. even heard of mm. the expectations are not there and it might either go very well or it might go very bad that's what happened initially so when we went to direct to consumer we got very bad reviews like i think about 30 out of 100 reviews like 30% of the reviews were very bad hmm. either some people complain they were very hard some people are saying they are expecting it's like a pure chocolate which melts in your hmm. mouth hmm. not like a utility but more like hmm. a snack hmm. but that that helped us change our packaging so all those things the feedback right hmm. so we literally enjoyed when we got a bad review i didn't have i didn't I, it made me happy but i was not very happy when i got a five star review hmm. but i was super happy when i got a one star review hmm. because i needed to understand what people think about it not what i think about it because i know i am biased to it so that that's one of the biggest reasons why we went very very slow in the first two two and a half years we didn't spend a penny on advertisements we didn't market it we just like organic i went and yeah. gave pictures i spoke with people i spoke into podcast like we got some good free public review like press reviews press releases and all that stuff so it was all very very organic the only big expenditure was my trade shows because that i had to spend like in some places so and once we got all this feedback we converted our spoons to the newer shape we researched it more and we made it thinner to so it's easy to bite but made it wider so it still stay firm to eat with your eat with your food so all those things we made some changes the taste was like initially it was very bad then we we understood how to add sugar to it again we are not food guys right so that's the thing that we needed to make sure that we need uh, people like it rather than us liking it so that again even right now i wouldn't say all the 100 people out of 100 out of 100 people would like it I, i'm pretty sure there are like 10 to 15 people who would hate it that's fine but i i made it better from 30 people hating hating it to 10 to 15 people hating it we can't make all the people happy but that's fine so uh that but we need we improved on it and thankfully or unthankfully i don't know what happened but it shark tank approached us hmm. when we won a Uh, one thing i did was every trade show event i used to attend the pitch competition and i used to pitch for it i used to apply for any pitch competitions that i see okay i would have i i, I don't even remember the count i just no matter if i find an opportunity i just go there i don't care mm. if it gives me sales or not mm. i want that visibility and that mm. helped me a lot because once we won the pitch burner competition and fancy food show in san francisco in 2020 that caught the eye of the shark tank producer and they approached us and uh, did you go there with the intention of getting the investment or was it also more of like a marketing uh, or promotion both 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 uh, obviously marketing you can't everyone knows that's a huge uh, opportunity for your free marketing or something that you can get hmm. that's one part and the second part is i needed help especially with an investor who knows the retail connections so re- working with retail and cpg is a huge thing it's like literally you won't make money the first 5 years mm. in the cpg industry especially in retail b2b mm. is a different ball game altogether uh, but b2c retail direct to consumer retail is a very uh, once i learned that i was scared i was i was lit- literally afraid when whole foods came in and said hey i want i want to try your product like no mm. no 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 let's not do it right now it's not the time mm. because the cost the, the the unit economics don't make that much sense once mm. you go into that retail because there's a distribution there's a retail wholesale margin there like too many things the buybacks give backs free fills free pallets like it's a huge uh, thing altogether so mm. the person without a food industry background it would be super hard for me so one of the reasons i went there i thought 
which would help me was one of these sharks. Most of the sharks have this huge experience in selling the CPG products. Hmm. So their expertise would help me propel forward, forward faster. So that's the re- second reason why I want to go there. And it, it, truly, I really wanted one of them because uh, forget about equity, forget about thing. See, my, my goal is what? Uh, impact, right? Hmm. And with a shark, that impact can be made very fast. I yeah. know that for sure. Yeah. So that that's one of the biggest reasons why it's not about like I didn't care about valuation, equity, and all that stuff. That's all secondary. But the first thing is impact, and having a shark with your in your team will obviously propel that impact faster. So I know that these days consumers are very interested, especially in the Western world, uh, very interested in sustainability and trying to do their part in terms of you know trying to save the planet. So, you know, a product like this is definitely appeals to that kind of consumer. Have you seen, uh, you know, based on your success um, or the success that you're getting now, um, have you seen other and other competitors enter in this kind of market and try to, um, so like, do you, ha- do you see other competitors selling similar products on Amazon? And, and do you have any patterns to protect against those kind of uh, things? Um, on the impact side, having people, more people doing this is actually good for the planet. Yeah, it might hurt my business, but that's okay. Uh, but as of now, we don't see that many options which are edible because we, I mean, from the market research that we did, I don't think there's any other company which is which has the scale that we can do. Again, there are a few companies which come up with it, but scaling is the what matters, right? I mean, yeah, I'm telling you, right? If you have, if you have like two to three weeks in your hand and the right molds you can make it at home it's not such a big uh, uh, not a big rocket science but again scaling it making a million per day is what is is where the challenge comes in and we are patent pending on the process the process that we invented how to scale this up is what mm. we are paid what we applied patent on we didn't apply patent on edible cutlery there are a lot okay. of them already so it's about how to make them is what differentiates us rather than the product itself and what is unique about that process? That makes me really curious. Like what, what was the big challenge in terms of the scale? Because I would think with so many consumer products, like that problem would have been solved already. It might have. It's, I, to be frank, I really don't know how the other things are made. Uh, like I, I did research on some of the cookie manufacturing before, but our process is a little different. See, the, the biggest challenge here is the spoon or the cutlery need to have the strength it's easy to bake a cookie, but obviously you can't scoop anything out of it. It breaks mm-hmm. immediately. That pressure or that compression, uh, the tensile strength is what is the technique that we kind of, uh, that Krivel figured out and, uh, yeah, and how we, we went through with that. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're not in retail right now? Um, we are, but we, the problem right now is inventory. See, remember I told you, so we switched from yeah. the old product to the new product. So because of COVID, the new product, the new the new machinery for the new 2.0 product got delayed. And the last six months, we, to be frank, even after going on Shark Tank, we couldn't sell more because we were out of inventory. What, 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 what do I do with it? Right? Mm. So, and the logistics is not helping me. If any, anything coming from India to here, it's taking six to seven weeks. Mm. So there are a lot of these challenges that we're going through, even though we got so much of publicity, we can't sell more because we don't have more. But slowly they are ramping up. Like right now, just like, in the last few weeks, we can now make about 30,000 new spoons per day. We had the capacity of the old spoons like six months ago, but because we switched, we had to not stop all our old spoons. We can't sell both old and new, right? It doesn't make sense. We already made improvements to it. So that's what the biggest challenge is right now. Uh, previously, we are in about 300 to 400 uh, TJ Maxx, Marshalls, and home goods stores in the gourmet food section. Mm. That's the only retail that we agreed to because they didn't have any distributor and all this headache. They just got the product from a warehouse and they sold they took care of the sales i didn't have to market for them on behalf of them so that's why i agreed to them and we consistently got sold out there so i don't even i can't even claim that it exists there right now because it's all sold out okay. so uh yeah right now we do have only our uh, small spoons vanilla and chocolate and stock in our website so if anyone wants to try it out they can visit incredibleeats.com uh, to to look at to try those two flavors out. I'm sorry, we're out of the black pepper, oregano chili, and uh, plain and other sporks and other fun things that we have. But we'll be in stocks like mid March or late March. So this so, product coming in. So it seems and, like yeah. I mean, yeah. 
Go ahead. Yeah, and, and another good news is uh, we are we just recently partnered with the Dippin' Dots. So soon in your nearest zoos or aquariums or theme parks or even a Dippin' Dots store, might you'll see in the up, upcoming summer some of the edible spoons with their ice creams. So, so are you for the direct to consumer? Um, are you doing any marketing, any paid uh, marketing no. or advertising? No. So you you don't okay. Uh, right now, no, because as I said, right, I need to have inventory to do some marketing. Yeah. What? Uh, so we always like brought something, sold it off. Brought something, sold it off. So how will I market it if I don't have anything to sell? So that's one of the reasons. And other thing is, we are going through this transition of this to one point to two point oh. So mm. I wanted to the transition to complete before I invest money in marketing. So to be frank, like the total ad money, like literally the social media ad money in the last two and a half years I spent was only forty dollars. Okay. <laughs> what is your uh, fulfillment shipping strategy? So when you get orders, um, do you uh, do you have a fulfilling fulfillment partner? Um, how do you ship it out? Um, yeah, we recently switched. Uh, we went to Ship Hero. Ship Hero is a three PL. Um, we send the product to them and they ship it out to the entire United States. They have one location in Pennsylvania, one in uh, Las Vegas, and there's another in Texas. Right now, we are at two locations to ship it to East and West Coast customers. And uh, one thing we noticed is carbon emissions because of freight, because we're shipping the product from India to here, and here also it's shipping within from the from the warehouse to the customers. So we calculate all the freight, uh, all the carbon emissions from the factory to your plate. And we compensate it twice, so making us carbon negative. So mm. I can proudly say we're one of the very few products which are carbon negative. That means we offset twice the emissions that we make. And for anyone who doesn't know what that means, like you pay out twice the yeah. amount of money to to a company that does what? The, it 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 actually does twice two things. Um, it works with the projects across the world. For one is by planting trees to offset the emissions. Second, it will apply opportunities where it can convert future emissions with solar or wind or other types of energy. So it's called Green Print. You can look into their website. Impact mm -hmm. Collective is their, or is their firm for CPG products. So that basically says you, you give them, like they calculate the total distance traveled and everything. And they give us a cost saying that, hey, per spoon, this is what you need to pay us for it to be truly carbon negative. Okay. And another interesting thing we do is plastic negative. That's very rare. People don't think about plastic uh, impact. And that's one of the biggest things we do as well. A lot of people, a lot of companies talk about carbon negative, carbon neutral. Even if you look open google.com, it'll say carbon neutral since 2007. But they never put anything how much plastics they consume. So I keep telling to people that there are two major threats for our future children or future generations. One is climate, other is plastics. Mm. For some reason, climate always trumps first because people can feel it. People can mm. feel the heat. People can feel the cold. Mm. But plastics just gets in, gets uh, gets hidden because people don't feel the plastic. Yeah. But soon they are starting to feel right now. The research shows that humans are consuming up to a credit card sized microplastics every week there's microplastics in your baby's poop there's microplastics in the remote locations inside the yosemite where there's no contact to the sea or the oceans at all so nature is giving back to us hmm. but people are not worried about it because they don't feel it personally yet and soon they will hmm. so so that's why we actually calculate any plastic that's used from the factory till the consumer like for example if Amazon is sending my box of spoons in a plastic bubble mailer, I hate it. I'm telling not to use it, but they sometimes use it. And if they use it, I calculate how much weight of the plastic is. And I give this third party organization to go pick up the equivalent amount of plastic from the oceans, which already exists in the oceans mm -hmm. and, and reuse it with respect to recycling it and using it again in the, in the, in the nature. I hate, I, I don't like it, but that's the best I could do. So mm -hmm. I, even a wrap around my palette, a palette is, Generally, pilots get wrapped in plastic and shipped over. That's, that's one of the requirements. I don't know why. Mm. But anyways, so that wrapper, I calculate how much weight I, I use it and I, I take it from the ocean. So I'm trying to be as good as I can because I believe a business or a startup should think about these big questions first rather than thinking about money first and then thinking about this. Because if you look at the current companies, I don't want to name anyone, but a lot of big companies which are the worst polluters or polluters of plastic in the world, after becoming billions of dollars of companies, now they're thinking about it. Hmm. But 
who's responsible for the past decade or two decades or three decades. Mm-hmm. Now they're thinking, even now they're not saying we'll change it. We're saying, oh, by 2050, I'll do this. <laughs> So I I hate I, I kind of hate that because I I don't want that to be in my in my company because I want this to be purely built on a base that, yeah, impact first, then everything comes come else comes next. How big is your team? Is it really just uh, you and your partner? Yeah. Or? So you know, yeah, Cruel takes so the fact takes care of the factory in India. I think right now we have thirty five people working at the factory, and we also only employ people who are uh, were, who used to live under five dollars a day so even we're trying to on the human aspect of it also we're trying to be nice and all the waste in the factory gets fed to uh, the stray dogs and cows and animals across across the, I mean, the city that we go we go feed them because there's some waste there's a breakage and there's some waste in the factory right and uh, we we do a good as much as we can and coming back to the us it's me and i met jack three or four months since i started this business jack has been an amazing guy he used to be our we are vice president of sales now he's also a partner of the company um and and uh, he also has a work. He doesn't take a penny too. He's also purely passionate and doing good to the planet. And he has he has work four days a week and three days a week. He works for incredible. And just two of us right now. We're show, running the show as of now. And we have a mentor, Mike Perro, from our, one of our venture capitalist uh, accelerator program that we participated in. Um, and he take, he started recently taking care of the retail. Yeah, just two three of us, and he's just a contracting to us right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, in every entrepreneur's journey, there's always, you know, times when, you know, they make mistakes or there's failures in the process. Can you share like maybe your biggest mistake or failure that you think, um, uh, you know, happened in the, in your entrepreneurial process and what can um, others learn from it? Um, yeah, sure. So one of the biggest mistakes I made initially was to trust everyone because mm-hmm. I remember I told you I'm not new to this industry, right? So I met a lot of people and some people, most of the people are very great, especially in food industry, they're very helpful. They tell you, they don't hide any data from you. You ask you a question, they immediately give you an answer. But uh, there were a few people who approached me saying that they will represent my company, my product and make sales across the US, make it super big and all that. And I trusted them and uh, I lost close to 15 to 20 K giving retainers and cash to them. And that was the biggest mistake I made, but it's an expensive mistake, but that made me realize that I need to be careful with mm. whom I work with. Um, all, and again, I would blame my inexperience to that because if I had an experience, I wouldn't have just agreed blindly yes to someone like that. It's just they had a very good, strong, convincing factor that I just agreed to. Okay. With. Yeah, but now it's a good, a good experience. Now I'm like any any broker or anyone who's coming and saying, "Hey, I I'll do this, I'll do that, give me this." I'm like, okay, yeah, you can do it, and then take the money, not not mm-hmm. before. Okay. So so uh, I, I I know I know how to reply back and you know okay. that's one of the again it's it's uh i wouldn't say it's a lot of failure but it's a good experience and exper- expensive experience i would say mm-hmm. uh so but that that's that's how, one of the things that i learned and the second thing would be um I'm not raising as much as I should, as I should, especially not having much experience in the food industry and expanding my team. I'm still trying to get fix that. See, my bigger biggest concern is I just don't want to hire someone for the sake of hiring them. Mm. I want to find another Jack, right? Who is truly passionate. I mean, I don't expect them to work for free. No, mm. that's not my goal. It's my goal is they should not come with a with a fact saying, "Hey, I want to make this much money and I want to be the employee three of the company so that I can make millions later." Mm-hmm. I don't want to be person to think like that, but I, yeah. it's very hard to find someone who doesn't think like that. So that's yeah. one of the biggest reasons why I'm taking it super slow to expand my team because I want that passion to be shared as much as I can. Um, and and yeah, so that's the second thing which I'm still trying to struggle because I shouldn't be doing this all by myself or me and Jack. It, yeah. I need to have a good team to do this and support me. And that's how it will grow faster rather than just me trying to handle multiple things, Jack. So now we're going to move on to uh, the rapid fire round where I'm going to ask you a quick uh, few questions and you have to answer them maybe in one word or two words. Uh, One book recommendation that you would uh, recommend to entrepreneurs in 2022 and why? Um, This is a book from Dale Carnegie. I'm pretty sure most of you guys know how to influence people and make friends. That's an amazing book. It doesn't matter about sales and all that, but it makes, it gives you an idea how to talk to people and how to be nice. So that I like that book a lot. An innovative product or idea in the current e-commerce, retail, or tech landscape that you feel excited about? Um, 
I feel excited about the new innovations in packaging that are coming through. There are a lot of people who are trying to convert to waste, agricultural waste into biofilms, which can compost easily and also water soluble uh, materials. So because a lot of, uh, forget, forget apart from the cutlery and this like tableware and all that, a lot, unfortunately, a lot of things get packed in plastic. So I wish to not see that anymore. So I I get very excited when I see those things. Yeah. Um, a business or productivity tool or software that you would recommend or productivity tip? Of course, you're working quite a bit, so you must have some. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, there, I mean, there are a lot of these project management apps, like I we use HubSpot, we also use Notion, and now we recently used Asana for one of our, one of our designers. And I, again, see, it, I can't say one or two because you have to find the right match for you. Uh, what I'm trying to say might not match your business at all, but it, it, just find the right match and keep searching for it. Just explore, right? Most of these tools have like one or two months free trial period. So just explore them, see whether you're using them and then and then use them, continue with them or get rid of them. So make the decisions. And uh, yeah, so uh, business side, be very, 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 uh, what do you call, miser, I would say on your expenses because that helped me a lot. I didn't really, because for me, see, coming from India, um, I still have this feeling in the back of my head that each dollar is 70 times more valuable yeah. because it's 70 rupees, right? So that that kind of helps me because I, I can't really put $4,000, $5,000 for ads because when I come convert that to a number that I have to go tell my dad, I'm like, oh my God, he's, he's going to just like, why? The question will come is why? Why do you have to spend so much? So that mm -hmm. kind of helped me. I, I'm, some people say it hurted me, but it's okay. It hurts me. But so that's one thing. I mean, you'll find other alternatives, right? Like for example, the Dippin' Dots partnership that I made recently, we made recently, it all went because of LinkedIn messages. Mm. That doesn't cost you much. I mean, mm. I am also, uh, one thing I would recommend all the entrepreneurs is sign up for that LinkedIn sales navigator. Okay. That helped me with so many connections that I, I important connections. Yeah, they might not help you learn the business that mm. you need to really go on the field and meet people. But to actually meet, connect to, it, it it takes time. It takes time and endurance. I literally spent 30 minutes a day for six months to find the contact of different dots and meet them right, send them the right message at the right time. So all those things matter. So, but again, but the tool is pretty good. Okay. So, and it didn't cost, it just costed me like $80 a month. That's not a lot. It's like my phone bill. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, a peer be, 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 be wacky about marketing. Like don't think you have to spend money to let people know that it exists. I, I can, another small example I can give is one of a very famous pop singer. I can't disclose her name. Mm -hmm. um, she referred us uh, I approached her without spending a penny on marketing mm -hmm. I approached her and she introduced us to Live Nation and Live Nation introduced us to Concert Hall and we sold the first 10,000 spoons to a Concert Hall back in 2020 so all this without spending a penny so you, sure. we can do it it just takes some time and patience okay. uh, a peer entrepreneur or business person whom you look up to or someone who inspires you um there are many. That's why I'm thinking. <laughs> so there are quite a few people. Uh, like the, the, first, in, the first person that comes to mind. Uh, first person is my partner, Krugel itself. Uh, okay. Because, uh, yeah, he, he's 90 percent of his effort on the machinery. So okay. um, yeah, the drive that he had was pretty good. OK. And the final question, best business advice you ever received or you would give to other entrepreneurs? Um, yeah, drive with a lot of passion. So that primes everything and along your journey, please think about the planet because trust me, it will, the, your, the luck factor of your business will change a lot once you start thinking about nature. It's going to give back to you. Perfect. And, and you can show me as an example by getting approached to a shark tank, even with a visa on the <laughs> visa on my visa on my passport. <laughs> so, yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dinesh. I really appreciated. Uh, I mean, I, I definitely appreciate all the passion that you have in terms of saving the planet and, and making a difference and for sharing your story, sharing, uh, you know, how you grew your business, started your mm -hmm. business. Um, and yeah, thank you so much uh, for joining us today at Trip Talks. Yeah. Thanks, Sushant, for the opportunity. I sincerely appreciate it. Likewise. And please eat your spoon today. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.